We welcome the joint statement on reprisals led by the United Kingdom and joined by a cross-regional group of countries calling on all states and the UN to prevent, respond to, and ensure accountability for cases of intimidation and reprisals against those who engage or seek to engage with the UN, as well as a joint statement on China by a cross-regional group of 39 states rebuking the Chinese government's widespread human rights violations in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, and Tibet proof that a growing number of governments are voicing alarm. We welcome a resolution on the right to privacy in the digital age with strong language on biometric technologies and encryption, recommendations on artificial intelligence, and once again expressing concern about threats and harassment faced by human rights defenders. The resolution on extrajudicial summary or arbitrary executions upholds the right to life and acknowledges impunity is a major factor in the continued killings. We welcome the rejection of an amendment attempting to remove reference to particularly targeted groups, including killings of human rights defenders, lawyers, journalists, and because of one's sexual orientation or gender identity. We welcome support by a majority of states for the resolution on a moratorium on the use of the death penalty. The text reiterates calls for a halt of executions with a view to abolishing the death penalty and includes additions on the importance of civil society and public debate, the role of UN treaty bodies, and the discriminatory application of the death penalty on women. We welcome the adoption of the resolution on inclusive development for and with persons with disabilities urging non-discrimination, accessibility, and inclusion in the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. We specifically welcome the request for the Secretary General to report on the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy. We deeply regret numerous amendments proposed by Russia and the United States across all resolutions relevant to gender. We are concerned by persistent attempts to break consensus and reverse long-standing global agreements achieved through extensive negotiations among member states including on rollover resolutions, as well as persistent attempts to limit access to sexual and reproductive health services and delete references to the UNFPA and the WHO in the context of COVID-19. We welcome the adoption of the resolution on child early and forced marriage by consensus, despite attempts to weaken the text. The resolution called for transformative, participatory, and adequately funded COVID-19 response measures we commend the support of a majority of member states for the re resolution on intensification of efforts to prevent and eliminate all forms of violence against women and girls. We regret the attempt to break global consensus on an issue widely recognized as a gross human rights violation and public health issue through the U.S. and Russian amendments. While all delegations ultimately supported the resolution, it is discouraging that a vote was called we welcome the adoption of resolutions on intensifying global efforts for the elimination of female genital mutilation and on intensifying efforts to end obstetric fistula, both of which were technical rollovers from respective 2018 resolutions and are encouraged that most states rejected proposed amendments to weaken the texts. We welcome the adoption by consensus of the resolution on women and girls and the response to the coronavirus disease COVID-19 presented by Spain underscoring the fundamental role of women and girls in pandemic responses and calling for gender responsive action to the pandemic. We also note the adoption of the resolution on strengthening national and international rapid response to the impact of the coronavirus disease COVID-19 on women and girls presented by Egypt. While we commend the rejection of U.S. amendments, we regret the failure to incorporate a human rights perspective in addressing the impact of the pandemic and to comprehensively address the sexual and reproductive health needs of women and girls. We welcome the adoption of the resolution on trafficking in women and girls, calling on governments to enhance preventive measures to address underlying causes of increasing vulnerability to trafficking. Despite U.S. attempts to amend the text, we welcome additional references to COVID-19 to this technical rollover text ultimately adopted by consensus. We welcome the cross-regional support to the resolution on the human rights situation in the Islamic Republic of Iran, which recognizes ongoing systemic and systematic violations in the country, urging Iran to hold those responsible accountable. We also welcome the cross-regional support for the resolution on the situation of human rights in the Syrian Arab Republic 
which condemns human rights violations, including arbitrary arrest, detention, torture, and killing of detainees, and calls for accountability. We welcome the passage of the resolution on the situation of human rights of Rohingya Muslims and other minorities in Myanmar. The resolution highlights the urgency of addressing root causes of human rights abuses and the critical need for accountability for violations of international law against Rohingya and ethnic minorities. We welcome the adoption by consensus of the resolution on the situation of human rights in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, highlighting the widespread and systematic human rights violations, stressing on the importance of following up on recommendations of the 2014 report of the Commission of Inquiry, and considering referring the situation to the International Criminal Court. We welcome the adoption by consensus of the resolution on the treaty body system and urge member states to reaffirm the formula contained in resolution 68268 so that adequate human and financial resources can be allocated at the fifth committee and treaty bodies can function effectively. This year, the limited opportunities for civil society participation at the third committee were reduced even further in light of the in-person restrictions due to COVID-19, removing encounters with stakeholders at the UN headquarters. We are deeply disappointed that more member states did not extend invitations for civil society participation in online informals and defend the importance of civil society participation, particularly given that 14 organizations had called on UN agencies, mechanisms and treaty bodies well in advance of the session to ensure that civil society voices can be meaningfully engaged and included as the UN continued to adapt its work to the pandemic. We hope and look forward to increased collaboration and engagement in the future session.